Hello and welcome to our round table, the Russian-Ukraine war and the media. We are doing this round table during a time of great urgency in Ukraine. And we ask that we all keep the Ukrainian people in mind as we listen to our speakers and the discussion tonight. This event is co-sponsored by the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival and the Park Center for Independent Media in the Roy H. Park School of Communications at Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York in the United States. I am Patricia Zimmerman, director of the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival. We kindly ask all participants joining us this evening to go to the three dots on the right hand top side of your Zoom image and rename yourself with your name and your location. It's very helpful to our speakers to get a physical sense of where you are. Our format for this event will be short opening statements by each of our really amazing uh, presenters with uh, some exchange with Raza Rumi. Then we will move to a Q&A and dialogue with you, our audience and participants. If you have a question or a comment, please raise your digital hand. We ask that you have your camera on for your question. Our producers will bring you into the screen to join the conversation. Do note that we will not be taking questions in the chat this evening. Instead, we kindly ask you to join us on camera as we are in the more interactive meeting format on this Zoom. And this kind of democratic participation is our way of showing solidarity with the Ukrainian people. At the end, our presenters will provide some closing thoughts on the war and the media. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Dean Amy Faulkner of the Roy H. Park School of Communications. Dean Faulkner. Thank you so much, Patty. And, and thank you to everyone who's on this call tonight. This is such a critical issue for us to discuss. And I, I'm so grateful to both Patty Zimmerman and Raza Rami for organizing this. Um, when I joined Park, and it was only about a month ago, these two folks were two of the first two people who came to meet me. And they are directors of wonderful programs that are under the Park umbrella. But they're also great visionaries and leaders. And so they wanted to put this special panel together for our discussion. And so I just want to make sure that we thank them and I thank them for allowing me to introduce everything tonight and really welcome everyone here on this call. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Office of Philanthropy and Engagement. They helped us put this together. My understanding is we're close to 300 people on this call tonight, and that is fantastic. I want to thank you for being here because this means you are interested in being global citizens. We need more of that. We need more discussion. And that's what tonight is going to be about. I think when we think about Park School and being a school of communications, and we look at the three panelists that you're going to hear from tonight, think about this. We've got journalists, we have storytellers, filmmakers, historians, people who can frame an issue. And so listen closely. I hope you will engage with us. It's a wonderful opportunity. I hope we have some freshmen on our call tonight. I know we have people across the globe watching us tonight. And so Ithaca College is very much in support of this. The Park School is of these wonderful organizations. And I personally, I won't have a chance because it's gonna be a very engaging conversation to thank our three speakers, but I thank you as well. So I'm gonna turn things back over to Patty and she's gonna continue with this discussion. Thank you, Dean Faulkner, for those wonderful words and for your support of both the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival and the Park Center for Independent Media. I would now like to introduce to you my wonderful and very cherished, brilliant colleague, Raza Rumi, Director of the Park Center for Independent Media. Our producing team will be posting the more extended bios of our speakers in the chat as well as many links and references uh, to help all of us learn more about 
uh, the Russian-Ukraine war. Uh, Raza? Thank you, uh, Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, really delighted to uh, welcome you all and, and uh, host this uh, event. On behalf of the Park Center for Independent Media, I welcome uh, our speakers and all the participants who have joined from different parts of the world uh, to this event tonight. Uh, we are delighted to host this roundtable with the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival, which has been our partner uh, for years now in producing important and significant events and conversations uh, like this one. Uh, the Park Center for Independent Media studies uh, media outlets that create and distribute content outside the traditional corporate systems. It also examines how independent media can affect change on journalism, democracy, society, and participatory cultures. We have three major voices this evening to, to discuss the war coverage in the media, news institutions, uh, one must remind, must uphold fairness and accuracy while covering war, and above all, show the magnitude of suffering caused by such conflicts. According to the latest estimate from the UN, uh, the war has de displaced 6.6 .6 million people within Ukraine. It has further led to a recorded total of 6.3 million uh, people crossing international borders from Ukraine to neighboring countries, including Poland and Moldova, and 13 million people are estimated to be stranded in dangerous places or unable to leave for security reasons. The recent sh shelling at the Zaporozhia nuclear plant in southern Ukraine has caused further risk with the threat of nuclear accident imperiling the region and leading to calls for, ev for evacuation today. To address these intensifying humanitarian crises, the United Nations and other multilateral institutions must intervene to contain Russia and pave a path to a peaceful resolution of this conflict. And it is the responsibility of media organizations across the globe to demand these institutions begin uh, peace building. In May, our colleague, Dr. Zimmerman, who opened this event, wrote a piece for a magazine that we run called The Edge on the Ukrainian President Zelensky's appearance at the Cannes Film Festival. Her observations reflected trends in media beyond the festival. I quote Dr. Zimmerman, Zelensky's powerful speech on Zoom about the Russia-Ukraine war screened in opening festival ceremonies with Tom Cruise's Top Gun Maverick, a $170 million Hollywood blockbuster de facto heralding the US military with zero sense of irony, unquote. Where few calls for peace are found in corporate journalism, stories instead probably, uh, proliferate reciting or regurgitating intelligence from US government sources, reporting on Russian military purchases and cheering on further military aid. The Biden administration announced on August 24 that it would send another $3 billion in military aid supplementing the current total of 53.6 billion since March. As some news organizations in the independent media sector have pointed out, a long-term commitment to funding war does not encourage a peaceful outcome. The, continu the continuation of this conflict is compounding human suffering. Soldiers and civilians, land and buildings become the, sub the subject of sensational coverage that reduces them to numbers in a game. We must remember and remind that real lives are stake here. It is the critical responsibility of media to argue and a call for peace. Much has also been said about the disinformation as an instrument of war. Russian propaganda has been relentless, but questions have also been raised about the Western media. When they deny NATO's role in stoking the flames, Americans are left unaware of their most effective tool in preventing further crises, pressurizing their own government to stop undermining negotiations and to join the negotiating table. Dismissing these realities threatens to prolong the war in Ukraine indefinitely. To quote a media critic in the US, a leading one uh, who works at fair.org, 
Uh, the current crisis with the US and Russia about Ukraine is the test of many things, not least news media's ability and willingness to disengage themselves from these frozen narratives, from uncritical parroting of official sources, and from the devastating idea that diplomacy is weakness and massive violence or threats of continued massive violence are the best ways to address conflict. I end here and I would uh, invite um, uh, that, uh, our uh, first speaker, uh, who is from Ukraine, Natalie Grivinakl, who is an experienced journalist and a media pro producer uh, from Ukraine and has contributed to leading international media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, among others. Her detailed bio is there in the chat box. Uh, over to you, Bhartali. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to today. Um, I am honored to speak in front of all of you. And I'm honored to be at this particular event and to share the, the perspectives and news and the information on, on what I know about what is happening in Ukraine, in particular with media. Um, and also, I'm really thankful for everyone for supporting um, and willing to listen to the voices uh, from Ukraine, because for us Ukrainians, me in particular, uh, it's very important and um, we are very thankful because we are indeed in need um, to share uh, what is continuously going on because unfortunately the uh, attention to the situation and the attention to the war is dropping as, as it, it, it was in 2014 because I want to remind you everyone that unfortunately the war hasn't started on the 24th of February um, of this year. The war has started eight years ago um, in 2014. So um, let me uh, briefly tell you information about uh, the media situation in the country. Um, at the moment, um, approximately 435 crimes were made against journalists, uh, in particular in the past six months after the 24th of February. Out of them, 37 journalists were killed and uh, approximately 215 media got closed because of the aggression. Uh, Russia is trying to literally destroy not only the infrastructure, not only uh, you know, um, military units, but they, Russia is deliberately trying to destroy uh, the possibility of access of Ukrainians to the proper information and the pop and the, you know, uh, the factual information on what is happening in the country. They are destroying TV towers. They are uh, targeting journalists unfortunately deliberately with press written all over them and killing them. And um, they, of course, they are uh, seizing offices of uh, different offices when they occupy different territories. They seize it and, and close um, the editorials from working. Um, at the moment, uh, financial situation of a lot of journalists in Ukraine has dropped down many were forced to, to move out of the country. 74% uh, in according to the recent statements uh, and research done by international um, media organization here, uh, Media Institute, they are saying that 74% are saying that, you know, they have very bad situation financially and 86 are, th are saying that uh, in 2023, the situation will even get worse. And if to talk about um, what um, what factors right now, what situation right now journalists face in Ukraine, I can say definitely that um, first of all, um, they are trying to. Uh, a lot of them are trying to work without proper protection, without proper equipment. Many got 
you know, lost the equipment and, 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 and the production is not uh, affordable to, uh, for instance, regional uh, journalists. A lot of them are balancing their, you know, personal. I have the Zoom open. I wanted to take a few. Uh, sorry, uh, their personal situation, uh, basically, uh, try worrying about their families, worrying about uh, what is happening because they are working, many are working under shellings, many are working from towns that are being targeted and, you know, missiles are being dropped on. Uh, some are working from the occupied territories and they have forced to work in cognito. So they are under severe danger. And uh, additionally, what I need to say is that uh, a lot of them are trying to uh, understand how to work with the war crimes, because uh, right now, uh, many journalists in Ukraine are collecting war crimes and uh, documenting them for further investigations and for uh, further uh, courts. And um, at, at the moment, uh, journalists are also learning how to become war, uh, war reporters, because even though we had a, a war for eight years, uh, m many civil journalists didn't have enough of experience and um, to work uh, under uh, war conditions. And right now, uh, the war has been, you know, pretty much throughout all, all of the Ukraine. And I, I would need to um, finish, uh, I know I have only five minutes, um, to say that um, at the moment, um, the situation is the following, that civil journalists are being blocked from working in the, in the front lines. Uh, it's several days ago, they, they basically, uh, Ukrainian authorities, military authorities, prevented them from, from going there. Hopefully that's gonna change. But uh, I would like to share with you a 40 seconds video uh, for you just to grasp um, how journalists are working on the front line for you to be and to become this journalist interactively uh, and seeing how it is to work as a journalist on the front line, if possible. Now. Tell us what's happening right now. Guys, Greg. right now, artillery rounds. Taking. Looks like his shot is frozen as we speak. I don't know if you can still hear us. Is this the, small arms fire? These Greg, are artillery rounds. Spilvin показував українцям війну з передових позицій. Прилетіло два РПГ. І тут одразу почалася перестрілка. Він без вагань пішов боронити наші кордони. Тепер черга гармасів. Зараз розрахунок підходить до гармати і починається бойова робота. Гармата! Постріл! Це носій касетних боєприпасів. Таке по нас сьогодні тричі прилітало. Thank you so much for, for sharing the video. So you can, you can see, uh, you know, the conditions of work uh, of uh, military journalists and many civil journalists unfortunately became war reporters you know trying to report from uh, not only the front lines from from uh, from these trenches as you have seen but also from cities that are being you know shelled and uh, from villages so uh, unfortunately we we've learned new skills right mm -hmm. Natalie, thank you so much. This was uh, such a somber reminder of all that the journalists are uh, facing. And uh, I would urge all the uh, all those in the audience to check out her article in the Committee to Protect Journalists website that talks about the uh, risks and dangers of uh, to journalists in covering this war and all the uh, various problems that reporters are facing. I shall now invite um, our next speaker, Marsha Spielberg, uh, who's an assistant professor of film and electronic arts at Bard College. And uh, her detailed bio can be found in the chat box. Over to you, Marsha, and thank you for being here. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Um, like Natalie, I tend to worry a lot about the fact that the Russia-Ukraine war is kind of losing traction in the West. Um, and it's lovely to see that there are so many people tuning in for this. Um, I am a film historian and a film scholar. 
Um, and so I thought what I would do first is I've been thinking about the, the ways in which I engage with news about what's coming out of Ukraine. And I should say I'm originally from Odessa, Ukraine, and I'm from a family that's split. So I left with my mom, but my father and my brothers are still in Ukraine. Um, and so I'm, I'm very <laughs> concretely concerned about what's happening there. Um, so when I reflect on the, on the news coverage that I consult, I would say that there are kind of three layers. The first is always Western news coverage, the things that we all know right, BBC, New York Times, Reuters. Um, I wanted to share some links in the chat. Um, so uh, Ukrainian news tends to happen largely on Telegram channels. And so for the Ukrainian speakers who are present, I shared some links to that. Um, and then uh, the Russian opposition is also, I'm a Russian speaker because I'm from Odessa. Um, and so I tend to listen to a lot of the Russian opposition's coverage. And of course there's varying you know, interests um, and varying uh, investments with each of these channels, but I just wanted to put those all in the chat. Um, but that said, for the next four minutes, what I wanted to focus on is not so much news coverage, um, but a different form of audiovisual media. So if we think about news as wanting to inform, um, I'm looking at audiovisual media, which seeks to document what is happening and to preserve it for posterity for the future. Um, and I think there's actually something very hopeful there because it imagines already a future after the war. Um, and yeah, uh, and a kind of need to historicize what is happening. So Ari, if you don't mind um, starting with the slides. So first I wanted to say that covering the covering kind of a wartime scenario is not anything new in the Ukrainian context. Um, so the next slide, uh, it's something that has a really robust history. So during World War II, uh, the Soviet front line had the most cameramen. I mean, people were filming on all front lines, but the Red Army had 258 cameramen covering the war. And part of the motivation for this was exactly as Natalie said, to document war crimes so that later at Nuremberg, as they ended up doing, they could use this as evidence. Um, and so the, the drive to collect evidence is very important. Um, I want to talk about a few collectives that have arisen in Ukraine to do this. Um, they spread their, uh, they distribute what they film primarily on YouTube, Instagram, and Telegram. I would say those are the three main channels um, with some media being also distributed on Facebook and on Vkontakte, which is the Russophone uh, Facebook group. So the first media collective I wanted to mention is called Babylon 13. I would say that it's the first, um, kind of the largest and the most prominent. It's got 119,000 followers on YouTube. They got a head start in a certain sense. So the collective was formed in 2014 on the Maidan in Kiev. Um, to document those events. That was kind of a big revolution, anti-corruption revolution that happened in Ukraine. And at the time there were 50 members who wanted to film this event from all different angles. Um, and they were organized in large part by somebody named Yuri Gruzinov. And they managed to produce an archive of more than 300 videos. And they say that their goal was explicitly to memorialize and showcase the birth and first decisive steps of civil society in Ukraine. And so during the Maidan, um, they developed a certain style so they express in their mission statement a faith and documentary as, quote, a tool that is able to change people's perception of reality. Um, and they employ primarily observational footage, people talking directly to the camera. Um, there's zero voiceover, zero commentary of any kind. And the idea is to let viewers decide for themselves what they're seeing um, and to create a kind of experiential form uh, of participating in the event, a detail rich, you are their alternative to the evening news. Um, they're very aware of their mission as historians. Um, so, uh, and I should say that after the Maidan, they started immediately documenting the annexation of Crimea and the war in the Donbass starting in 2014. Um, in 2018, they handed over 300 hours of footage to the recently established Maidan Museum. And in 2021, they created a historical series on their YouTube channel with a young historian explaining how the Maidan unfolded using clips from the group's videos. And so in the intervening years, many of the members fell away but in February, when the invasion happened, a lot of them came back on. And so currently the collective has about 80 members. Um, it's being coordinated largely by somebody named Volodymyr Tichy. Um, not all of these people are filmmakers. Most of them are producers, people who provide logistical support, uh, people who provide subtitles. Um, and Tichy, when I spoke with him, said that only about a dozen are actually kind of filming um, out there. They've managed to produce more than 150 videos since the start of the war. Um, and here's, this is just their interface on Instagram. And then I think I have another picture of the interface also on YouTube so that you can see how you can interact with it. Um, the videos usually tend to be one to 10 minutes in length. Um, when the war first happened in the first week, they were sourcing found footage from people all over the country, um, but they've since moved back to a much more cinematic style with high production values and beautiful framing. Um, and in a piece that I wrote a few months ago for a, a, a 
online journal called Dacalog, I argue that the videos can be grouped into largely four categories. So uplifting profiles of regular people who use their professional skills to help the war effort. Um, actually, Ari, sorry, if you can go back two slides, we're not there yet, we'll just pause. Yeah, uh, and I'll let you know when to, when to move forward. So if we can go back, that's the next collective. So for Babylon 13, it's uplifting profiles of people like a train conductor who has done dozens of trips on evacuation trains, um, sculptors, like classically trained sculptors who are making portable heaters, an icon painter who makes icons to send to soldiers on the front. That's kind of one category. Another category that really fascinates me is a presentation of all the labor that goes into war beyond just the fighting. Um, and so that those are all videos of volunteers who are sorting, storing, and distributing humanitarian aid. Um, regular citizens who are covering monuments and sandbags in anticipation of being occupied. And on the other side of that experience, cleanup crews that are trying to clean up all of the recently liberated towns. Um, the third category is a focus on vulnerable populations, which I think is really, really important. So um, they think about people like the workers of the Kiev Zoo who didn't want to abandon the animals um, that are there. So the animals as a vulnerable population of children, of course, and also Roma. Um, they're one of, one of the few groups or collectives to talk about what's happening with the Roma in Ukraine. And then finally, the fourth category is documentation of war crimes, um, as Natalie also mentioned. So these are solemn videos that take stock of the damage in places like Baradyanka, Bucha, and Irpin. What's not there, what they're not able to document a lot, what I know they wish they could film more of, um, is videos shot with the Ukrainian armed forces. They've only been able to make one because the army just doesn't want to reveal any information, um, and so they haven't been able to, um, to film with them. What I find fascinating about this collective is the audience. So the Maidan videos in 2014 were shot mainly for a domestic audience. Um, and now are seen as a teaching archive, right, for Ukrainian children. Um, the war videos, I would say, have three distinct audiences that they're aiming at. Um, they have playlists, as you can see right on the slide, perfect. Um, they've got playlists in Ukrainian, English, and Russian. Um, and so there's a distinct attempt to pierce through the Russian state propaganda apparatus to Russians who have VPNs and who can log on to YouTube. Um, and they also post Russian language videos and bilingual posts on Vkontakte, which is the Russian language Facebook. The distribution, like I mentioned, is primarily on YouTube and Instagram, um, but occasionally also Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And their approach, I would just generally say, is multilingual, multi-platform. Um, they describe themselves as producers of a certain anthropology of, of the war, um, and they say that their goal is to tell the latest history of Ukraine. Their claims to documentary purity sound, might sound a little bit naive. They say this is pure documentary without embellishments or propaganda. Um, I would say that it's not exactly an archive from below. It's a very carefully curated collection of films produced by members of the collective. Um, but the advantages of this approach, as Dale Hudson and Patricia Zimmerman, who has generously brought us all together, also mentioned in Docalog, produces, and I'll quote from their article, a polyphony of voices from multiple regions that counters Russian claims about Ukrainian nationalism, right? So if Russians are claiming that Ukrainians are Nazis and nationalists, here we see a really wide variety of people of all different ethnicities and backgrounds being showcased. Um, it also counters a tourist approaches of most art documentary, and it really is a kind of a more democratic form um, of documenting the war effort. Um, and in their article, Dale and Patricia also say that they disavow Russian misinformation and Western voyeurism. Um, and finally, I would say that they emphasize the process of documenting and bearing witness as something that is just as important almost as, as the final product. Um, and I know I only have like 30 seconds. So the, the next two collectives I'll just mention briefly and I'm happy to talk about them more in the Q&A. Um, the second collective is called Free Filmers. It's a collective of artists. Uh, here we go, here's their interface. Um, they are originally from Mariupol. Uh, because Mariupol is an industrial city, they were specifically interested in the post-industrial Soviet landscapes and the transformation of the urban environment. Um, and they've got a kind of anti-capitalist agenda. They've got many fewer followers, only about 1,100 followers on Instagram and 133 on YouTube, um, and they share videos primarily on YouTube. But they've got a really fascinating compilation of six videos that document Ukrainian resistance, so people in occupied cities coming out in the streets um, and protesting against the occupation, which always takes my breath away. Um, um, and uh, a 15-year-old's uh, video of the siege of Mariupol. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you, Marsha. Maybe mm -hmm. we can uh, talk about the other collective in the Q&A session. Sure. 
Uh, okay. I promise we'll give you more time. <laughs> so, okay, uh, apologies for that interruption. And let me introduce our third and final speaker. Uh, very delighted to welcome uh, Zenon Vasliu, uh, a professor of history at Ithaca College. And his detailed bio shall be posted shortly in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Professor Zenon, for being with us. Over to you. Well, allow me to give a little bit of a background uh, I guess I'm a member of the Ukrainian diaspora. My parents immigrated from Ukraine as war refugees, and what we're seeing now is really the fifth wave of, of immigration. I had the opportunity and to learn a lot to do research in the old Soviet Union, both in Kiev and Moscow in 1984 and 1986, and then after the fall of communism with the Academy of Sciences. And part of the battle line now is history and, and, and academics. There was a real clue over a year ago with Putin's speech where he recreated an imagined history that is clearly, can be clearly described as neo-colonialism, neo-imperialism. Meanwhile, Ukrainian scholarship and even in the larger field is working with the term of decolonizing history in, in Eastern Europe as well. Uh, I'm connected with a number of scholars through social media, and, and it's kind of jarring uh, in terms of trying to save material, trying to save archives. We have to understand that the bombing and that the attacks also focus on universities, uh, cultural institutions, things of that nature. I'm aligned with a number of uh, cultural scholarly associations and when troops came into uh, Mariupol, Kherson, other areas, word went out that people were saving libraries, trying to save documents. I think what's important to note is we're dealing with two different trajectories in terms of what's happening right now. Too often people don't realize that Ukrainian history not only goes far back, but it's very complex. Uh, you had different experiences, uh, a variety of political trends, cultural trends. And for example, the first call for an independent Ukraine was in 1895 by a Marxist, a Ukrainian Marxist who deal, who's dealing already with this uh, issue of colonialism and imperialism. This great power chauvinism was even brought up by Lenin, who said one of the greatest issues is the rise of great Russian power chauvinism and a call for empire. I, <laughs> I can only get started, but I think a big turning point was the Euromaidan of 2014. And here we see a move to the rise of a civic identity, of a civil society. One of my areas of uh, research is dealing with religious institutions. And people, media really doesn't deal with it or else they only deal with it with the framework of the Orthodox Church. But since independence, there's been an all Ukrainian interfaith council. It has 15 different churches or religious groups represented. Uh, they rotate membership. So one year you will have a, 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 a Muslim leader. Another year you have uh, for example, a Protestant leader, and the uh, sociologist of religion, Jose Casanova, mentioned that Ukraine, out of all of Europe, has the greatest religious pluralism. You might think, well, in a secular society or whatever, but that means really an identity that really can vary. Uh, in terms of other form of media, I was also thinking of Eurovision. Why do I mention Eurovision? That's again, selected by popular vote, popular culture. And for example, one year we had uh, Jamila who was elected, a Muslim Ukrainian, another year, Gitana, an Afro-Ukrainian. And of course there's Verka Serdyukha, who kind of breaks all gender boundaries, who is also popularly elected chosen and uh, and uh, uh, her song sounded like Russia goodbye or whatever the case may be. So what I'm getting at is that 
it's more complex. There have been richer connections from the past leading up into the present. Uh, Western scholars were West planning and very lazy about following up. It was young Ukrainian scholars who were saying, saying things have changed. There's a different identity. There's a new, there's, there's inclusion. And perhaps a good tie-in is with the election of 2019, when a Jewish Ukrainian comedian, clearly from the world of media, was elected with over 70% of the vote. And in many ways, today's Ukrainian government is run by media. And so there's just so much overwhelming information coming through. Uh, and again, historic, historical battles taking place, uh, uh, narratives, because even in Russia today, there's a great article, Putin the Terrible, where with film, they're bringing back the Stalin era films of Alexander Nevsky, Ivan the Terrible, et cetera. So as a historian, I can go more and more into background, but in terms of media, a lot is now happening in terms of not only historical debate, dealing with neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism, which people forget wasn't only American or Western colonialism, uh, and even like with the invasion of Iraq, that was, I'm not gonna go into that that much, but we can draw different types of parallels between great power chauvinism. And so I'll end it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was truly fascinating. Great power chauvinism and the perspective. Uh, uh, you know, I, we have a large number of uh, people attending this event, and, for, and let me thank them all. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, I would not pose uh, follow-up questions. Instead, I would request uh, those in um, attendance to actually raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, may I request further that please keep your questions really brief. Uh, do not try to give too many comments, uh, ju just so uh, we, we can have a, a more wider coverage of uh, all different perspectives and questions. So, uh, you know, uh, let's uh, see who is our first uh, person uh, who wants to ask a question. Um, yes, okay, we have Brendan Bennett. Uh, Brendan, uh, very soon you'll be spotlighted. So please ask your question. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, so first coming from uh, class of 2004, a uh, former student of uh, Professor Waslu. I'm currently a major in the United States Army. I am um, the second mission director for NSA Colorado. And for all those in the media from Ukraine, I just want you to know that the United States military involvement is not waning like the media is in, in the West. We have a steadfast uh, eye on what's going on in the region. And uh, just want you to know that we are definitely focused on what's going on there. So my question to you, Mr. Uh, Rumi, is um, while it's easy to be critical of the military industrial complex and to call for peace, um, isn't it also hard to deny that President Zelensky is calling for military aid from both, U both the US and NATO? Uh, thank you. I think uh, you, uh, Brendan, obviously, uh, uh, military and non-military aid re requested by the Ukrainian president has to be responded to. There's no question there. But at the same time, we highlight time and again, uh, you know, that there is also something called uh, peace journalism. And if, uh, mil if military aid is given uh, coverage, then those voices within the U.S. and outside uh, those who are arguing for a diplomatic uh, settlement or negotiation or in, end of war should also be given due cover. It is a matter of fairness and accuracy. But I think I would actually ask for Pro Professor Zenon to address this question. Brendan, it's great to hear from you. And I do remember you. And please send me an email. Uh, I, think, I think the reality is, is that... Uh, 
uh, Ukraine was, as I think Masha and, and Natalia mentioned, the war started back in 2014, 2015. 2014, Ukraine's military was not prepared. And, and you had a corrupt ruler back then in the, in the form of, of Yanukovych who was anti-EU, et cetera. And sometimes I believe it's a false narrative by West planers that NATO was posing a risk. Could you imagine if the Baltic states were not part of NATO? Ukraine is a big country. It has over 40 million people with different regions. And uh, the brazen attack, part of the reality, I think, Raza, is defense. Mm -hmm. It is defense. And as people mentioned, uh, Ukrainians have a reason to fight. I brought up a few of them, you know, freedom of the press, civic liberties, pluralism, uh, a, again, a, a greater identity. So I think what Brendan brings up is a hard fact reality. However, I think what's more important is Ukraine's desire to become a member of the European Union. And in some ways, Ukraine has been moving further towards meeting the goals of the European Union than, let's say, Hungary, which is kind of reversing the course. So yes, we all want peace, but there's a certain reality of, 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 of survival. I mean, there was an interview of a Ukrainian soldier when he came under attack. Uh, the U.S. sent uh, food packs. And the Ukrainian soldier said, oh, the Skittles were very good. Well, that's another reality. That's another reality. Thank you, Professor Vasliu. Maybe I'll ask, uh, this is an important uh, question and issue. So maybe Natali and uh, Marsha, both of you can also weigh in quickly on this issue. Natali, what, how would you respond to that? Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, it's an important, <laughs> it's an important issue, an important question. Uh, Ukrainians are very thankful for all of the military support and military uh, donations uh, that are being given. Uh, in the past uh, in the past years and in the past months um, but as correctly uh, mr professor said uh, that indeed in 2014 pretty much ukrainian society has restored you know, ukrainian army because before uh, and due to you know it's a, it's another topic of another discussion uh, due to various reasons when you know military equipment has been sold and there were lots of in, in, inside uh, in, you know insiders that were working for, for Russia in Ukrainian um, army and in Ukrainian secret service etc it, it's a topic of a different discussion but in, in indeed you know the army in Ukraine has pretty much where it was non-existent. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it's one of the main, um, one of the main peculiarities of, of, uh, of, Ukraine, of, of the war between Ukraine and Russia is that how the society is reacting, how the society pretty much uh, is, is becoming, you know, the or engine and the force uh, that, uh, pretty much is changing is changing the situation in, in the in the country. Uh, I I I never seen other um, pretty much I never seen other countries where society in in, in a, pretty much ninety percent of the society is being involved in the volunteerism is trying to donate to the army is trying to collect weapons is trying you know our, one of the our volunteers actually bought a satellite. <laughs> satellite you know so, so, so it's something something that it's very peculiar so by add, answering to your question is yes um 
we do not want war. We are defending ourselves. We are defending our right to basically exist just because that was the right that was, you know, uh, you know, threatened to, to us. You know, they would like to take it from us. So yes, we, but we need to defend. And one more thing, and sorry, uh, sorry, Raza, but I just want to add one little please, thing. Please speak. <laughs> uh, I know uh, what Ukrainian army and soldiers and you know people in Ukraine are actually saying about the military donations and the military aid. They are very thankful, but sometimes the aid comes very long, very it, it takes a, a long time and it takes um, and pe people are dying pretty much every single day. You know, hundreds of people, dozens of people are dying and um, in the military. And we're expecting these donations. We're expecting this, uh, this help, you know, time, you know, months, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, they are announcing the, the military the, the donations, but sometimes it doesn't come fast. It doesn't come, you know, open. So I, I really would like to stress that, you know, uh, we, we need to keep on, you know, asking for more because we actually need the, uh, this and especially we need uh, anti missiles, uh, anti missiles weapons because ninety percent of the destructions uh, or, or, or the deaths of the civilians, etc., are done by the missile attacks. And usually Russians are doing it at night or in, early in the morning. I was a witness of that as, as well. So in, 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 we are not protected from you know missiles falling unexpectedly at, at five o'clock in the morning somewhere where you do not expect it to, at, at all. So we really need either to close the skies or anti-missile, you know, um, weapons to protect, you know, U Ukrainians, to protect uh, civilians and, and, and soldiers and our army. I will thank you. Uh, thank you. Masha, may maybe you'd like to weigh in? <laughs> Very briefly. I want to second everything Zenon and Natalie said. I think the, the kind of the key point of what Zenon said is that this is an existential threat, right? It's a threat to the existence of Ukraine. And so there's no middle ground position. I think Ukraine has to defend itself. And so I don't think there's a, <laughs> there's not like compromising for peace is not a possibility at this point. I think what Natalie said about the agency of every of everyday Ukrainians is really important. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I'm so interested in what these collectives are doing is that they're documenting that agency. And I think we have reverted to a kind of Cold War scenario where it feels like it's the US versus Russia, right? And Ukraine is this battleground. And very often when we've seen these kinds of scenarios in the past with Afghanistan or Pakistan, et cetera, we don't get to hear about the efforts of everyday people. And we don't recognize the fact that they have a lot more agency than sometimes we want to give them, right? We imagine these superpowers battling it out. And so I think that one of the strengths of the work that these collectives are doing, even more so than I think everyday regular journalists, is highlighting the fact that people do have agency on the ground and that sometimes situations can turn in unexpected ways because of regular citizens and how committed they are. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, and, and we have to remember what state Russian media, what kind of message they're sending. Yeah, propaganda, yeah. Not only propaganda, it's, it's vicious and violent. We have to understand that as well. I follow Medusa and, mm -hmm. and other outside sources, but uh, things are still stirring up. Mm. I'm sorry. But... No, no, thank you. Thank you for that intervention. We have another question from Mark Engstrom. And, uh, uh, before, uh, and after that, Marsha, I will come back to you about the collective that you were meant to sp uh, speak about in your presentation. Yes, Mark, go ahead, please. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm a, a 1977 graduate of Ithaca College. I spent a number of years working in media as an attorney. So this, this uh, session tonight is of particular interest to me. Um, my question is about the story of the war as it extends beyond the borders of Ukraine. Um, Western Europe is certainly looking at a long, cold, dark winter potentially. Uh, that story should be relatively easy to cover. Uh, I'm also more interested really in the impact of the war within Russia and how will the West become aware of what is effective in terms of turning the tide, if you will, of the war uh, by our actions as it impacts Russian people 
But also, I'd really like to know, and this is something I've had a hard time grasping anecdotally from watching the media, um, what are the Russian people really hearing at this point about the impact of the war on the Russian army, on Russian resources? Um, you know, I have a Western perspective, clearly, given the media access I have, but do the Russians have a sense that their military has not lived up to uh, the expectations that may have existed prior to the commencement of this campaign? Great, that's a great set of questions. And uh, uh, maybe we, we shall uh, take the same order. We'll start with Professor Zenon and go to Natalie and then ask Masha to add. Well, you know, the level of repression is insane. Uh, Russians are not allowed to use the word war. And recently a journalist was arrested, given a seven year sentence in prison for saying that it's a war. Uh, at the beginning of the invasion, a number of Americans said, oh, well, there can be peace protests. There were peace protests. People were arrested, were beaten. Some people are saying, uh, Stephen Kotkin, for example, a specialist at Princeton, is saying you kind of have this military police state of the Stalin era. And again, as a historian, it isn't just Ivan the Terrible or, or others that are brought up. Uh, the Stalinist era is, is getting a reprisal. And so, and I think Masha and, and Natalia probably know more about the media, but I really uh, follow the Russian press that's outside of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Medusa and, and other sources because they can't survive. So there really is an information. And, you know, and, and I think another piece is when you have opinion polls, because you have the Levada uh, opinion poll takers, but are people really going to say something? And uh, oh, that that that's enough now because we can make comparisons with the uh, Afghanistan inv invasion as well. But Masha, or, yes. or Natalie, Natalie, I'm I'm happy, I'm happy to jump in briefly. Please. I'm working on a book right now, actually, that we're finishing up on contemporary Russian documentaries. So I've been thinking about this a lot. I would say that within, within Russia, it matters a lot where you're located. So there's metropolitan elites, right? And then there's the rest of the country. And metropolitan elites, a lot of them have VPNs, right? And so they have they can access information from outside of Russia. And exactly what Professor Vasiliev was saying, that a lot of the independent media has moved to the Baltics primarily or Poland, and they're broadcasting from there and people are tuning in using VPNs. And so I would say that in metropolitan centers, people do still have access to kind of a wide array of media or some independent media. The problem is that the vast majority of the population outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg um, doesn't know how to do that, isn't technically savvy, um, and is kind of much more wrapped into the television. And then there's also a demographic breakdown by age, right? Where generally people 40 and plus, tend to get their news primarily from television. And so those are the people who are locked into the Russian state propaganda narrative. And then younger folks tend to be much more savvy about finding other sources of, of information on the internet. Um, so I think having that demographic breakdown is kind of helpful in thinking about Russia. Thank you, that was really, really interesting. Uh, Natali, uh, maybe you can now weigh in with, uh, uh, because you would know about the Russian uh, disinformation and, and all the media messaging they, they're doing. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the question. It's indeed a very important question because we need to understand, you know, in order to stop something, we need to understand the origin and we need to understand the reasons uh, what is standing behind. So uh, unfortunately, uh, Russian population I'm backing up on Maria as to as to as to what she has been saying about the, the breakage of the demographics and um, and situations with the metropolitan urban areas and you know outside of Moscow or Saint Petersburg. Uh, but what is indeed very important is that uh, unfortunately um, people are being so brainwashed and the Russian propaganda is being so uh, strongly um enrooted into different angles because what is russian propaganda russian propaganda is pretty much you know a very i i wouldn't say smart but they are very sophisticated ways of uh providing information so they are they are choosing 
So basically they're choosing something that is pretty much correct, uh, like maybe 20% and then turning it upside down and bringing and putting it, you know, Mm, additional, uh, un, you know, untrue information, or uh, just by turning the, the things from black to white. And sometimes then when you, you show them if photos of Butel, you show them, you know, a situation, you know, um, or in Mariupol of mass graves, and they're saying, oh, no, it's, it's not true, or it was done by the Ukrainian army. So they are just trans, trans, um, to, uh, basically turning the uh, it upside down. So of course, when the population receives this information from TV, from online um, segments, you know, from you know, pretty much peer to peer conversations, because you know, usually you know, families interact, friends interact, colleagues interact, etc. You know, who who says what? So the the uh, the population starts to. Uh, receive more, um, uh, it st starts to become more supportive of the government when they're constantly being brainwashed by this. But uh, what can be stopped is that, you know, the realities of, for instance, mothers, mothers of families of soldiers, of Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine and being killed here. Uh, there, there are several reports that I've been, you know, seeing how they they are trying to find their uh, their children here in Ukraine, and they are they are you know ringing the bells, alarming, etc. The the truth cannot be conceded for a long time. So, uh, you know, families of the soldiers, or uh, you know, um, other situation when when people cannot you know pretty much cannot say on white that this is black. It, it will it will prevail in in the end and it's just the matter is how long will it take to you know for the truth to come out and for the population to be more acceptable to the other situation but unfortunately at the moment um, by closing down the informational uh, vacuum by, by, by bringing a, a informational vacuum uh, to Russia it the situation might get even worse because you know people might not have a, an, an access to the other part of the information. But Just very briefly, there are parallels with Afghanistan and the Nobel Prize winning writer Svetlana Alekseyev, Alekseyevich wrote Zinky Boys, where it was women were able to fight away. And another brief point, and I think this follows up on Masha and Natalia, is that well-educated cosmopolitan Russians are leaving the country. Yeah. in the hundreds of thousands. And that's in a way uh, speaks loudly and in a way is hurting Russia as well. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a massive, I wanted to say that as well, what Zenon just said, that the problem with the cosmopolitan progressive elites is that most of them are leaving the country while the borders are still open, while they still can. I think there's estimates that maybe up to like 1.3 million people have left. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of Russians in Georgia and Armenia um, in the Baltics now um, who, are, who are leaving basically. And also because a lot of them are, are in threat too. people who identify as LGBTQ, um, like people who realize that <laughs> very, like Russia is already inhospitable to them and very soon will be far more than inhospitable. Um, and so that's the problem. And the people who are staying are people who buy into the state propaganda narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. That really, really fascinating uh... Uh, points. Uh, we have a, a, a question from Rick Ray. And Rick, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I'm, I've been driving and I've been listening to this Zoom, but I haven't been able to um, appear in it or ask a question. So I've stopped the car so that I can do that. I just Very would like safe. to say that <laughs> I... Um, I was outraged by the outbreak of, of the conflict in Ukraine. And I picked up a movie camera and went there by myself and began visiting people on the street, people in their homes uh, all across Ukraine as this war began. And I've recorded their stories into one to 10 minute vignettes. And I found a lot of difficulty in anyone taking an interest in them from film festivals to news organizations. It's not a common way to present documentary information. So when Marsha, I believe it's Marsha, Marsha, um, 
has introduced me just now to this Babylon 13 idea, I feel as though it's the perfect match for the work that I've done. And so I just like to know more about exactly who do I submit to, who do I contact to bring this out to larger than just my social media circle, and as well as those other, um, those other social media outlets that she was describing. I'd like to know more about it. So thank you for your time. Uh, Rick, I put some information for you about that in the chat earlier, but I realize now you couldn't see it because you're in the car. Just email yeah. me and I'll put you in touch with them. Um, but I, I would say that the work that you've done is incredibly important. Telling those people's stories is very, very important. Um, and I think that increasingly there's going to be more and more such archives forming across social media. Um, and so hopefully I can help connect you with them. Um, but just look me up, look up my name on Bard College, find my email and we'll be in touch. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Rick, for joining us. And once again, what wonderful contribution. Uh, and next a question from Andrew Utterson. Uh, please speak up, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Raza, and thank you to all of the panelists for a fascinating uh, discussion. I had a, a question. Much has been written and spoken about President Zelensky's uh, media savviness and his, his background and, and, and familiarity with ways of um, forms of persuasion and a media for communication. And Marsha mentioned Telegram. And I, I wondered what connections Marsha sees between uh, President Zelensky's uh, use of Telegram and uh, 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 as, a, as a medium of governance, uh, as well as communication, and the parallels with what's happening on the ground. And perhaps also to ask Natalie about the effectiveness of these communications and these particular strategies of, of, of creating preemptively a very particular narrative in the battle for hearts and for minds. And Zen on whether there are historical uh, precedents for this type of uh, information warfare, perhaps we could term it. Yes, great. Uh, that's a great set of questions again. Thank you, Andrew. So maybe we start with Marsha and then go mm -hmm. to Natalie and then to Zenon. Yes. I, I wish I had something more insightful to offer you. I, I think that you're absolutely right. I think that he is superb in, in media situations. Um, he knows how to say the right thing. He knows how to be concise, um, how to be articulate. Um, and we have, I'll just, this is an, an anecdote that I found interesting, but when the invasion first happened, I was speaking with my mom and I said, I feel so bad for him, right? This is a man who's clearly about to die. I was convinced he would be, you know, killed within the first few days of the invasion. Um, and my mom said, but you know, it's strange. He's an actor in a way. He's always been preparing for this moment, right? He's always had smaller audiences before, and now he has a worldwide audience. You know, you think he might be sad, but this might actually be like the, the best time of his life. Um, and I had never thought of that before, of him as an actor on kind of on the world stage. Um, I think that he has been incredibly efficient at communicating. I think that that's helped to build this incredible unity that we see within Ukraine. I would say now more than ever before, as Zenon was saying, uh, there's a sense of Ukraine as a multi-ethnic, multicultural state and a sense of unity that transcends all of those divisions um, that used to be there used to be much more felt before. And I think in large part, it is due uh, to his team and how good they are at communicating. Thank you. Natalie. Yes, uh, it's actually a very nice, uh, nice question because um, to give you a little bit of a background about Zelensky before the 24th of February, uh, there were different uh, opinions of the Ukrainians towards him. His rankings have, have been dropping since uh, 2019 when he was elected. You know, I wrote uh, mm, two articles about Zelensky, about his identity, about his origins, you know, being, you know, Jewish and being actor and being, you know, um, good speaker and et cetera, et cetera. But what can I definitely say? that uh, he, when his team united during um, unprecedented you know, full-scale attack when population needed someone to, you know, who will be talking to him, to them, uh, sh sharing what is happening, guiding them. Uh, I remember a, a small story, I remember on the 23rd of February, right before the, the escalation uh, and the attack, 
I remember him uh, speaking to the population, to the public, and not on. And I see, and I think he was speaking not only to Ukrainians; he was speaking to Russians as well. He was he his speech was so um, sincere. Uh, he really didn't want to have a war. He he knew that the war will come, and uh, I mean the attack would come. But he was trying his best to at least you know um, convey some of the messages that you know to stop that. And uh, I remember crying. I, I no one no one believed that anything like that would happen. But I remember crying after that uh, after that speech. And uh, these kind of things that he was was he was doing uh, afterwards, uh, talking every single day, having this uh, recording these videos uh, and explaining the position, explain or trying to motivate or trying to guide or trying to uh, calm down. Um, that is very important, and that's what Ukrainians are needing uh, at the moment or during this uh, military conflict. And um, communication-wise uh, and media-wise, um, I think it was very successful. Media uh, tried to support him as well, and trying to cut off all of the criticism and you know other kind of. Investigations or other things that media in Ukraine really because Ukrainians and Ukrainian population, Ukrainian media are not very keen on, on any government. So we are we are very critical to any government there there is. So uh, we love political shows. We love uh, you know political discussions. So we, we definitely uh, put the pressure on the government. But and right now everyone had a different agenda, and we are trying to survive. We're trying to unite. We're trying to investigate war crimes. We're trying to uh, make repatriation for those victims. We're trying to survive as refugees outside of the Ukraine because you know millions are outside of Ukraine, and we're we're trying right now as a country to to basically you know um, to to exist to 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 win and. Uh, Zelensky is 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 a good leader in at the particular you know in trying to do so and in trying to unite Ukrainians and we're very thankful to him. Thank you. I listen to uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky every night. He addresses the nation, and in a way, this might be broad, but I would compare him to FDR's. Fireside chat, a uh, combination of calming people and kind of the bravery of Winston Churchill on the radio. And I think even in the UK, they've been comparing Zelensky to Churchill. Andrew, I don't know if you've seen this or not, uh, but again, uh, his, his, his messaging is reassuring. The reality is he has a good media team and he has a partner, his wife. His wife is very active. I mean, you, it would be rare to find another spouse among political leaders. She came to the United States. She's gone to the front line. And I think there's this real equitable relationship between them as well. And with, uh, uh, as a footnote, uh, Servant of the People is on Netflix. So you can watch his program. I think it ran for five seasons. Yes. yes. I just want to chime in for one minute because I think what Natalie said earlier is really important. So Zelensky was elected with over 70% of the vote, but then his popularity plummeted. I mean, he was really unpopular before the war. And I think we tend to forget that now um, for a whole host of reasons. And also before the war, he had defunded the army. And so what uh, at least the Ukrainians that I'm in touch with now, what they jokingly say is, you know, he defunded the, like one of the reasons we were caught so off guard actually has to do with things he did before the invasion, but we won't take him to task on it now. We'll wait until we win. And when we win, we'll take him to task on it. And so well, it's and, you know, to think of his popularity as this kind of parabola, right? Of going from being very popular <clears throat> to very unpopular to very popular again. And, and, you know, there's this kind of esprit de corps where there's a, a way to find humor and absurdity in what's going on. And there's actually even 
a meme war and social media is also playing an important role as well. And there's a uh, kind of an IT army on the Ukrainian side with information, all volunteers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, uh, we have a question uh, by John McKenzie. So if you could please uh, speak. Hi, um, my question comes right off that last one. I, I, I teach at Cornell and I, I run a studio and we do a critical media and we actually consult with NGOs and nonprofits to do kind of this work. We work on death penalty things. And so my question is, one of the things that seems unprecedented is that there are the, there's a state, the Ukrainian state has reached out to cyber hackers, which is very, very different than what happened after 9-11 and I know some of the people here are aware what happened. There was a huge, right up until Seattle, there was a huge hacker, seemed like something was going to happen. 9-11 happened, it shut it down, and then there was a real divide. Now there seems to be something else happening. And I wonder if folks could, because this is not just representation. These are hackers inside of systems. What, yeah. This seems Marcia, like would you like to speak uh, about that? I, I want to make sure that I understood John's question. John, are you asking about Ukrainian hackers attacking Russian infrastructure or Ukrainians no. like recruiting? Oh. I'm talking about the Ukrainian government inviting hackers from around the world to help them fight the Russian hackers. Yeah. Yeah, I maybe maybe other people are. I, I know very little about. I mean, except so my brothers are both computer scientists, and they're both part of this Ukrainian army of volunteers, um, who are constantly trying to hack into Russian infrastructure systems. Um, but that's about all all I know. I might maybe pass off to Zen on who I think. Well, you're very aware that uh, IT is very strong in Ukraine. A lot of it is outsourcing. I think Apple employs many people and others as well. So the knowledge and the expertise is there. And we have to remember that during the demonstrations of Euromaidan, there was a wide representation, including uh, a group of IT people helping in the rebellion because they wanted the freedom of information. And I think the reality is there is so much cyber attacking coming from Russia coming from elsewhere. Uh, and I know it sounds idealistic, but I really think that the Ukrainian IT people are seeing themselves as defending the rights they've won. Sure, and sure. Yeah. a lot of the young Russians who are leaving are IT people. I mean, that's yeah. a huge drain taking place. So I think there's a whole other area that can be more closely uh, researched as well. Yeah. Yes, I, I would add that Ukraine and Belarus both have remarkable like IT talent. Both of them are basis for a whole host of companies, not just American, but also Western Europe, Western European who are offshoring. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so the talent is that yeah. is there. Yes, I also read this news item, but I mean, but what I know for sure is that Russian hackers are uh, one of the strongest cyber ma mafia you have in the cyberspace and they often work for you know small amounts to hack into websites and government systems you know much has been reported on that you know in, in diff by different countries actually but anyway I, oh i will also add that the reason that telegram has become so critical in this war i mean telegram really is where everybody in ukraine gets their news and shares information and how people stay in touch is because telegram is encrypted right it has to do with security and the fact that even lay people in ukraine are very aware of what encryption technologies are, how they operate, um, who owns whom. They're much more aware than us. I think sometimes when I go back, I sound like a very naive American because I'm not aware of who owns of who owns what and what secure channels for communication are. Whereas people there tend to be very, very conscious of that. Thank you for adding that, uh, Marsha. We have a question by Jonna Beresi, if you can speak up. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for this. I just want to thank everybody. Um, I'm a freshman at Ithaca College. I'm a current student of Dr. Zibrin. And admittedly, <clears throat> I may be uh, personally ill-informed on the war, but I I'm curious as to what the impact politically, socially of the countries surrounding Ukraine are, um, and, and what sort of ways are they supporting Ukraine besides taking in large amounts of immigrants and on the media front, like what is being publicized? Thank you. Yes. 
So maybe just a quick comments by uh, you, Marsha and Zenon, and then uh, we'll go towards wrapping up this, call, this event. I'll be super quick, Zenon, uh, Jonah, that's a very fascinating question. So a really big player in this whole situation right now is Belarus. Russia keeps trying to entice Belarus to join in the war. Russia, their troops are dropping and they see Belarus as a place where they can get more troops for the invasion. Belarus thus far has been a little hesitant to get their troops involved. Um, and there's a lot of conversation in the Ukrainian media sphere about how to entice Belarus to find a way not to get involved or, or to give them an out basically, or how they can frame all of this to Putin. Um, so they're kind of in the position that I think Franco or Mussolini were in, in World War II a little bit, um, where they you know, officially are in the axis of evil, but don't wanna to get too involved. Um, and then it's also been really interesting to see Central Asian countries react to the war because they're very afraid of being taken over. Um, and Kazakhstan has been pushing back against Russia, but in a kind of gentle way, um, but still pushing back. And so all of the former Soviet republics are very much on their guard um, against you know, being the next ones involved in this conflict um, and against not wanting to get conscripted in it. And just a brief reminder, just two years ago, there were massive demonstrations in Belarus calling the elections fraudulent. And there's a Belarus uh, government in, in exile. The, the wife whose husband originally ran for president was arrested and is in jail. And, and so uh, in terms of the former Soviet states, I think that's an important consideration. But in a way, uh, more countries are now joining NATO or plan to. And the European Union has never been as unified as it has been now. So uh, the intentions of Russia are kind of going in, in reverse. And as Masha mentioned, even these countries like Kazakhstan that would be considered close allies are, are, are keeping their distance. Correct. Uh, thank you. And maybe we should uh, go towards the final thoughts by our speakers. Uh, so each of you has a minute to wrap up. I mean, you know, your final sort of parting thought or takeaway or a message. Maybe I'll start with you, Natalie. Uh, yes, thank you so much. I, it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, and I'm very, uh, I was very interested to, to participate in it. Um, I would like to stress again that I would have started with my, uh, you know, my speech uh, today about uh, war crimes against uh, um, media journalists. I would love to call for accountability of Russia on all of the things that has, has it's it, it, like the country has been doing uh, in Ukraine um, since 2014, but uh, pretty much since February 24th. Um, we really need to talk about accountability uh, all the time and press and push uh, for uh, some of the actions and consequences uh, to be held. Because unfortunately, uh, if uh, after 2014 and 15 uh, annexation of Crimea or uh, you know occupation of the Ukrainian territories, uh, the um, the response would be more strict and the demand for accountability and for um, uh, for some uh, uh, you know things to, uh, basically accountability for Russians actions would take place maybe this uh, escalation wouldn't have happened because at the moment you know Russia was feeling quite safe as to as to what to do and as to their actions because they do not see any consequences in, in, the, in anything that they do. So at the moment, I'm, I'm really hoping that those consequences would come up. And I also would like to say that um, my team, uh, one person from my team is actually also joining this conference call. Um, we are doing a lot of, uh, you know, content on on Ukraine, um, and uh, a lot of videos, etc. And I would be happy to share to anyone who is interested, uh, you know, uh, people's stories on uh, or about what what they have experienced, uh, what is happening on the front line, what is happening, um, you know, all around Ukraine. We would be happy to share information and news and content, uh, videos and. Photos. So 
uh, do not hesitate if you have any questions or you have any uh, demands uh, to know more or to get more information, please do not hesitate to, to contact me and I would be happy to, to share anything I know. Thank you, Natalie, and best of luck and stay safe. Uh, uh, you know, your reporting is uh, is just amazing. I mean, one learns so much uh, from that. And I go to Masha now. Perfect, because I can build off of what Natalie said. I think accountability really is the key word. Um, and that's that's in part where the collectives that I was presenting on come in. News stories tend to evaporate, right? They have a kind of a short shelf life. Um, my hope is that as there are more and more audiovisual archives of what's been happening with the war and documentation of war crimes and documentation of everything that's happening, that can be that can help bolster right this accountability um, or make it possible moving forward. Thank you, Marsha. That was really a great uh, parting thought: accountability for the crimes of Russia. Uh, Zenon, uh, I would ask. You I'm a social and cultural historian. And the level of agency and volunteerism and sacrifice is really very, very unique. Uh, when I've attended other webinars from Ukraine, uh, local governance is just so important. Even in the regions like Kherson or Odessa or elsewhere where I have contact, these elected officials are taking responsibility. Other people are also taking responsibility. And another point of this is this Ukrainian-American diaspora mm -hmm. has kind of come forward, whether it's the Selka restaurant in Manhattan selling borscht uh, to help out, uh, not far from here. <clears throat> uh, people are collecting clothing, whatever they can find. <clears throat> oh, I'm losing my voice. And even settlements from 130 years ago in the anthracite region of Pennsylvania. Are, uh, are gathering together and showing concern. And I think you have many working class Americans who really empathize with this as well and are seeing kind of uh, that Ukrainians are really handling it all on their own. I mean, that's yes. the reality. Yes, that's reality, wherever they are. Exactly, that resilience and that agency also I mean, it is very visible on social media. I mean, that has been my uh, understanding from day one. But anyway, I think uh, we are almost at the end of our event. And I would like to profusely thank you, Natalie, especially because it's very late where you are for staying with us and uh, sharing such important information. And thank you, Marsha, for the wonderful insights on on the uh, documentation and and uh, and the efforts by ukrainian filmmakers and uh, and other media producers and of course professor zenon with the great historical sweep and the insights from the past and the present truly i have learned a lot in this panel and i'm truly privileged uh, to be uh, to, to be here and to interact with you all, and I must thank all the participants who are here, uh, to to the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival, uh, to our great producers, uh, to the Park School and its team uh, who were there at the right at the start of this event, to my colleagues at the Park Center for Independent Media. I, I mean, there's a long list of names. I don't want to hold everybody back. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, let me thank, and uh, we shall. I could conclude now. Bye. Mm -hmm. Before you. everybody signs off, there's a PDF in the chat, which has all of those links and quotes that went on throughout. So please grab that before you go away. If not, we can make that available to you later. And a few of the videos that Natalie's group has put together, the links to those are just put into the chat. We were hoping perhaps we would get to them at the very end, but of course, time is of what it is. So the links are there. Please um, make use of those. They're very important. Lots of great info. And thanks so much for coming, everyone.